Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. 10 a.m. still a little early, it is for me. Uh, I'm Rob Byrne, I'm president of the San Francisco Silent Film Festival, and I was a member of the team that restored Foolish Wives. And to my left here is Dave Kerr. I'm with the Museum of Modern Art, and I was privileged to work with Rob on this great restoration. So San, the San Francisco Silent Film Festival and MoMA combined with uh, many other institutions and organizations and individuals to help make this uh, restoration a success. Um, I have prepared a presentation here, then, and we will go through it. And unfortunately, Dave will need to leave somewhere in the middle of it. So um, the good news is you'll know what Dave talk looks like, and you can tackle him later on uh, during the week when you see him if you have questions. I'm afraid he won't be here for the Q&A. Anyway. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, it's a, the restoration was really a, a, a big effort that uh, took so many people. It began in October 2017 uh, with a conversation between Dave and I um, and finally came to fruition with the premieres in San Francisco and then here tomorrow. As I mentioned, the project was a collaboration between MoMA and the San Francisco Silent Film Festival, but we required, and it would have been impossible without the resources and participation of the Cineteca de Bologna, Film Fondazione, Cineteca Italiana in Milan, and our laboratory partners, Haga Film and Legit Le Magina Retrovata. In addition to myself, the primary team included Kathy Rose O'Regan from the festival, and she's sitting right over there, James Layton, and from MoMA, James Layton and Peter Williamson, as, in addition to Dave, of course. Um, and with Dave and Kathy here in the audience and on stage, uh, we'll be sure not to strive too far from the script. So the focus of the presentation will keep me narrowly focused on the restoration itself, but it's impossible to put the restoration into proper context without at least a little background on the film itself, a topic that, if properly explored, could easily consume a full semester graduate seminar. Foolish Wives was Eric von Schirrheim's third film, and up to that point, his most extravagant. It wasn't intended to be Hollywood's first million dollar picture, or at least Universal's Carl Lemelay didn't see it that way. But by the time it was finished, that's exactly what it had become. Stroheim's vision, and some, some say, might say ego, assumed epic proportions. For the production, Stroheim twice precisely recreated Monte Carlo, once in Southern California, and then again further north on California's central coast. The inland sets were used for the main square and shots that look into Monte Carlo with the, imagined, with the imagined ocean at the viewer's back. And the settings on the coast were used for shots requiring an oceanside setting and background. Here we have the reproduced Monte Carlo set as seen in the film. No details or, ex or expense were spared, including such extravagances as glazing all the windows so they would authentically reflect light. And here we have portions of Monte Carlo again, farther north at Point Lobos, not far from Monterey and Carmel, and several hours south of San Francisco. The location and setting chosen, were chosen to provide an essential ocean and seaside backdrop. Construction of these sets took months. Lumber and materials hauled to the remote site and constructed by a crew of 50 to 75 men. In this amazing panorama, courtesy of the University of California at Santa Cruz, we see Point Lobos location featuring the outdoor promenade, the exterior of the, of the Villa Amorosa, and the distance the set for the shooting club. And here's the opening shot of the Villa Amorosa, Amorosa perched above Point Lobos. And the setting for Monte Carlo's seaside promenade and as it appears in the film. In 
In addition to Stroheim's expensive ex insistence on realism and his obsession with detail, and the excessive, again, at least in Carl Amelie's mind, spending, the production was also beset with unforeseen and expensive challenges. Bad weather and a fierce storm destroyed much of the Point Lobo setting, thereby requiring construction to start all over again. But perhaps worse, about two-thirds two of the way through the shooting, actor Rudolf Christians, playing the role of the special envoy Hughes, inconveniently died of pneumonia. With so much of the film already shot, and with Monte Carlo's settings already destroyed, reshooting the scenes in which he appeared was out of the question. Instead, Robert Edelson, a former stage star then working in Hollywood, was selected to carry on the role. In part, this explains why certain shots featuring Hughes appear short or disjoint. In some places, shots of the deceased Christians were filmed, filmed for other sequences, are intercut with Edelson, filmed in reverse angle. Edelson's fill-ins are fairly easy to spot, always, always with his back unnaturally to the camera or his with his face obscured by a hand, branch, or bit of furniture. It's a fun game while watching the film to see when you can spot which is which. It's not that hard. According to studio estimates, spend, Sturheim spent $1,124,498 against an original budget of 250,000. Not bad. I don't know what would happen if we overran the budget on a restoration by that much. <laughs> <laughs> but you it's put that in perspective, and that is not a lot of money by today's standards. That would barely pay for a television program at this point, which is just how much the industry has evolved in all those years. Yeah. From this, Stroheim created his initial edit yielding a version that was between 30 and 32 reels in length, probably about six and a half hours of screen time. He thought that, he thought that the film would be screened in two parts on consecutive e evenings. The details of the story are too long to relate here, but ultimately the studio wrestled the editing from Stroheim's hands. First, having the film to 15 reels, and then further boiling it down to 14, about 14,120 feet, and a, three hour, and a three and a half hour version that premiered on, in January 1922. That 14 reel version screened only once, after which it was cut further to 10 reels, and then further revisions continuing for weeks afterwards. So for weeks after it opened, Newark audiences saw continually shrinking Foolish Wives. One would have thought that was the end of the saga for Foolish Wives, an unrealistically long 30 reel, six and a half hour version, harshly recut by two thirds to a commercially palatable 10 reels. And there you have it, or so you would think. But in 1927, Universal retrieved the 15 reel negative from their New, Jer New Jersey vaults and embarked, embarked on a project to recut and re-release the film. The film then shrank further to 7,655 feet, losing another two reels in length. The continuity was rearranged, some roles were redefined, characters renamed, and the titles were entirely replaced. The most logical assumption is that this was undertaken with the idea to re-release with a synchronized movie tone soundtrack. We have an interesting glimpse at the re-edit process that was apparently undertaken with some urgency. Note that in 1928, only six years after the production, the negative was already considered to be in poor condition. This reduced, rearranged, retitled, and reimagined version was never released, quite possibly for good reason. But tragically, the original 1922 version apparently died on the operating table. This 1928 recut is all that remains of the American version. In 1936, when the film library of the Museum of Modern Art requested a print for their collection, they received the mangled 1928 version, and for years it was assumed to be the canonical version. 
but let's file this away for now and talk about the restoration. <laughs> There's a story about Stroheim seeing the film at a festival in 1950 and getting up and saying, MoMA has destroyed my movie. Uh, no one knew what had happened, including Stroheim, but really anyone else until scholars later on turned up the story. Imagine his surprise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our challenge was quite simple. Well, actually not so simple, but to reconstruct and restore the film to a representation as close as possible to the original 10 reel 1922 release. Practically, pragmatically, and philosophically speaking, we knew such attainment would be impossible. But where's the fun in a quest if it's not impossible? We took as an article of faith that every decision we taken would be evidence-based where such evidence existed. We were faced with incomplete film materials and even more incomplete documentary sources, but left no stone unturned in seeking information and primary sources to guide our decisions. Obviously, there were times when we had no choice but to fall back on inference, secondary research, and professional experience, but we consistently resisted the urge to guess, create, or just make something up. At the foundation of our work were the principles of restoration film ethics. Quoting the FIOF Digital Statement 3, the resulting, the resulting restored work must, to the greatest extent possible, preserve and present a historical and aesthetically accurate reproduction of the original film. We could not and did not lose sight of the fact of the film as a historical artifact and that our task was not only to preserve the content of the film, a, content, a term I horribly despise, but just as essentially to preserve its aesthetic essence, including the hallmarks of its materiality, such as film grain, splices, laboratory marks, and camera instability. And alas, this also meant that we couldn't use CGI to make Robert Edelson look a little bit more like the poor deceased R Rudolph Christians. <laughs> so what are the physical remains of Foolish Wives? In the end, it boils down to two, two unique film sources and every other, two unique film sources. Every other known source is a duplicate or a combination of these two. And besides incomplete film sources, there survives no definitive documentation that, preci that precisely describes the film exactly as it was originally released. So we've talked about the recut, the 1928 recut, with the continuity rearranged and the, everything's changed. But quite fortunately, there was one more extant film source. The Fondazione Cineteca Italiana in Mata Milan holds a tinted and toned nitrate copy of the Italian release. And this is a good time to thank and acknowledge the Cineteca de Bologna and La Magino Ritrovata for their essential work in facilitating access to this print and providing the laboratory services to prepare and scan it. In addition to the tinting and toning, the film has, as you might ex expect, Italian language titles. But there is also a twist. The Italians print was struck from the film's export negative. As many of you already know, during the silent era, it was common practice to create more than one negative for a film. The first negative would be, able to, would be to create prints for the dom domestic distribution, and a second negative would be created for creating prints in the foreign market. This foreign negative would be composed of shots either photographed simultaneously or by a second camera, or using an alternate take of the same shot. A shot would be photographed multiple times. The best take would then be selected for the domestic negative, and the second best take used in the forum. And if we can dim the lights now, the house lights, run a clip. Oh, I guess these lights are the ones we went dim. Come on, there we go. And so here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the, uh, the American print and the Italian for the foreign negative. 
And as you can see, the action is, the continuity is exactly the same. The shots are in the same order. Um, they're not the same performance though, that often they're very close. Sometimes it takes a close eyes to tell the difference. Sometimes it's, it's much more obvious. The, uh, the shots in the American version tend to be a little longer. And we don't know if that was always the case. Um, it seemed the case with the Italian print that often the short shots were very short as if maybe it had been abbreviated or shortened. Yeah, it's somewhat mysterious just what that print is. Some of the shots are six, eight frames. Yeah, which makes so the, the, uh, the Italian print had numerous challenges, but, right. but on the other hand, there were many times when we had a shot or a sequence uh, that was only in the Italian version. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more, Re reconstructing the continuity. Okay, oops. And again. All right. And speaking of sources, thank you. This is probably a good time to pay homage to film historian Arthur Lenning. In the early 1970s, he endeavored to reconstruct the film using the duplicated versions of the same two film sources. We've made some different decisions in some places than he did and we had the benefit of additional information and technical capabilities that were not available 50 years ago, but that does not in any way diminish his remarkable achievement. If you've seen Foolish Wise before, such as on, on Kino's DVD re release, it's very, like, it's very likely the Lenning, the Lenning restoration is the version you're familiar with. It's no exaggeration to say that Lenning's work paved the way for much of what we were able to accomplish. And so now we know what's left of the physical film. What did we rely on to ensure that we were pulling the pieces back together as they had been originally? First and foremost were the film materials itself. We had the continuities in the film as found, um, which were in sync for the most part and which were the strongest indication of the this, of this shot sequence, not necessarily the, con the arrangement of what the order the sequences are in, but the shots within the sequences uh, were, almost, were always identical between the two film sources. We also consulted every bit of primary documentation we could locate, production papers, trade press, promotional materials, music score, sensor records, one exceptional document was a shooting script conserved at the George Eastman Museum. Now shooting scripts are usually not 100% accurate. They tell you what footage were shot or which they were intended to shoot, but they can ver result can, the, re the final result can vary significantly. And considering how many times the film was re-edited, the script can only indicate what may have been initial intentions. We also had access to an undated continuity for an eight-reel version of the film, courtesy of historian Richard Kozarski. Again, not a perfect source, but still one that provided useful clues. We also researched contemporary trade press, which often provided synopses or technical details, and sometimes provided tantalizing glimpses of shots or sequences that are not present in our film materials, such as Stroheim massaging May Bush in this photo montage, or Dale Fuller in this saucy maid costume. The original score for the music was also useful. It was, also, it was obviously nothing like even the barest continuity but it still provided clues regarding the order of things. Here's the title, Where Did You Get the Orchids? Later, the count settles into the boat. These are, this is a continuity in order you'll see in the film. What we recognize is one of the count's dialogue titles from the boat sequence, followed by the close-up of the clock, and so on. And a, sequ and a sequence you'll see from tomorrow night. But interesting, there's something we don't have. Sergius and Vera quarreling and him throwing her down. There's nothing resembling that in our, in our surviving footage. 
Determining the correct title text was one of the major areas of our restoration. I think maybe we talked more about titles than we talked about the image. Yeah. Uh, more controversial. <laughs> Keep in mind that we had no original titles. We had Italian titles in the in Milan print and the 1928 titles in the American source. We needed to get the text right, or at least as right as it could be, and also to reproduce the appearance of 1922 universal titles. In many instances, the 1928 titles fit perfectly, and we assume that they've been carried over unchanged. And sometimes this would be confirmed by comparing the translated uh, comparing to the translated versions of the Italian front. In addition, though, information on the title text came from any number of sources, including this article by a reviewer, enamored by their poetic fluency. Uh, because both prints lacked the original opening title sequence, we relied on text printed in the printed program from the New York premiere, and then recreated the style of other and then recreated the style similar to other Universal Jewel productions of the same period. Sensor records were also a rich source of information, including these from Kansas, New York, San Francisco, and Sweden. Reading these often came as a relief because out of the two film sources, we apparently had the footage for everything that everybody had found objectionable. Beyond that, the records were interesting in their own right. Most troublesome were some of the shots that had been described as the witch's cabin. The Count's attempt to undress and observe Mrs. Hughes were just too much for just about everybody. It probably comes as no surprise that Kansas and America went the furthest in describing objectionable material. Their list of cuts is so long it reads like a synopsis of the film. They objected to one of our favorite titles, Preparing to Stalk the White Doe, Brass Buttons Are Strong Magic, which at least confirmed to us the actual text of the title. And perhaps more hilariously, or depressingly, the Kansas censors stressed the requirement to eliminate all shots of women smoking. Other materials found their way, found their way into use such as this 1927 French novelization that I found on eBay. And by the way, you can still find copies there. Like the others, it may not have been a perfect source, but it provided illuminating tidbits. It certainly did, yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> not scholarly, but uh, he does uh, summarize uh, a lot of the missing material, including the first reel, which is uh, very intriguing. And I wish we had been able to get that information to this film, but that, that was not what we were doing here. That's right, we've talked, we've talked before about whether we do a, a Rick Schmedlin type restoration that he did with Greed of really flesh the film out, include stills, include all the story that uh, Stroham I originally intended. So maybe, maybe we'll spend another five years and do that sometime. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we do have stills for a lot of the missing scenes. Yeah, and, uh, exactly, exactly. You, you could do something like that, but that's not what we decided to, to do. So come back in uh, 2027 and we'll have that ready and we'll, we'll talk about it again. Uh, so like the, like the others, it was not a perfect source, but it uh, provided illuminating tidbits, not to mention a couple images from these scenes, as we were mentioning, missing from other materials, such as this shot of Maud George as Princess Olga in bed with some pretty amazing sleeping regalia. The one thing we did not do was just make things up. Throughout the film, there were noticeable cuts where undoubtedly there were once titles. In my mind, what I'll show you is the most dramatic. The se this sequence does not exist in the American print, and the Italian has, and the Italian has only the single title that you will see translated here. Let me hit the light it's again. Yeah. We'll let you guess the subtext after the clip. You see it? Yeah.
Okay. So can you guess the subtext? It is never explained in the film and may likely, may likely have never been explained in the original 1922 release. If it had been, it most certainly would have set off alarms among the most Puritan of American censors. But the maid is pregnant, obviously from Sergius, and he calms her by promising to marry her. This information was probably not, in, or may not have been included in the 1922 release. We don't know. Uh, but it was not on us to simply invent it and insert the titles that we thought might have been appropriate. And so now, as a member of this audience, you can enjoy this illuminating bit of unexplained subtext when you enjoy the film tomorrow night. You will probably know more than the audiences did in 1922. The text then became one of synthesizing all this information into a plan for reconstructing the film. To create the, to create the architecture for the restoration that included the continuity, the colors, the titles, which form film source would be used, and a myriad of other details. The result was a highly detailed blueprint that included every one of the 1,953 shots and titles. The blueprint not only laid out the work, but documents each, each decision and rationale. Who knows, someday, another 50 years from now, somebody will want to make another restoration. So we can, at least, there will be something that says what we did and why. We rebuilt the continuity with full awareness that there was no choice but to intermix the footage between the American and foreign negatives. When both sources included a shot or a sequence, we always chose the American version. After all, the goal, our guiding principle, was to restore the American release. But there were way too many instances where a shot or sequence was present only in the Italian print, and for those, those were included as necessary. With the film reassembled, we used specialized software Prim primarily Diamant from HS Smart to restore the image. A certain am amount of the process is semi-automated, but the majority of the time was spent restoring each frame hand by, by hand. The final edit of the film is comprised of 158,403 individual frames. We didn't count the hours, but it was easily several thousand. Well over eight months of two people working almost full time. This clip will give you an idea of the before and the after. Thank you. Okay. And now we're going to wave goodbye to Dave, who has to sneak away. Thank you, Dave. Clap for Dave before you. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Sorry that he had just disappear. I was hoping for him for the uh, the Q and A. Like I said, you know what he looked like now. He's hard to miss. So, uh, and I know he enjoys talking about the film. Oops. Um, there was also one other unique challenge. Well, there were many unique challenges, but such as removing this bit of roving film that had been printed in. This was, would have been in lab work. Uh, this would have been introduced in lab work somewhere after the release. Um, sloppy lab work, certainly not done here, um, but which took a ridiculous number of hours to remove and to also... Uh, respect the what was happening in the background you know the waving curtain and the leaves and everything uh it was it was not a simple task of just uh cloning over and getting rid of that bit of film 
you don't want to think about how many hours were spent on those 10 seconds. Um, okay. So color. Color is a huge and big and exciting uh, aspect of Foolish Wives. Um, after restoring the image, our attention returned to, turned to restoring the color. James Layton at MoMA carried out extensive work researching the historical color schemes, hues, and techniques. The film was extensively colored using the techniques of the day, which consisted of submerging sections of the film in a color dye, or toning, as you will see in the second band here, actually the first band in this image, which is a chemical process that changes the hue of the film emulsion, most commonly to blue, but not always. And here we are at Cineteca Bologna, who worked with us to secure the, Itali the uh, Milan print. We cataloged the colors of the Italian print shot by shot and captured some of the information, the information about the exact colors. And that's Dave, who's now gone, uh, using one of the most advanced archival equipment to capture the moment, his iPhone. <laughs> and that's what he looks like without an iPad. In addition to tending and toning, Foolish Wives had something special, spectacular hand coloring. And hand coloring is exactly what it sounds like. Painting each frame individually. Gustav Bach, Brock, who specialized in miniature paintings and indivi painting individual film frames. We know from historical film sources that the climactic fire scene in the seventh reel was extensively hand colored. Reel 7 has 18,209 frames. Not all are colored, and many are titles, but you still get an idea of the magnitude. Brock was, Brock was one of several individuals who made a career of individually coloring film. In 1930, he published one of several articles describing his art and regularly advertised his services in motion picture trade press of the 1920s and 30s. According to him, it would take him three to four days for each hand-colored print. And we have to keep in mind, he's not doing this once for digital copy. He's every single release print he's doing this with. But of course, it was not enough to simply know that there was hand coloring. We needed to know what it was colored and what it looked like. James Layton's thorough research came through. To recreate the fiery tower sequence, we used as a model an original hand-colored nitrate print at the Library of Congress of Fighting the Flames. Fighting, and Fighting the Flames was, was colored by another of these artists, Arnold Hansen, but the look was, uh, would have been the same. And The Kiss of Death, another film which was colored by Han Gustav Brock, gave us an idea of what the yellow highlighting would have looked like. But beyond knowing the technique, we went back to our evidence to understand what was colored. Brock himself described in a letter to Iris Berry, founder of the MoMA Film Archive, that astonishingly all of the prints were hand colored, both domestic and foreign. He also describes what was colored. The sequence started with the maid lighting the candles in von Stroheim's room when he expects the visit of the American minister's wife, and all the way through the burning of the tower until fade out. A review in the San Francisco Chronicle from April 9, 1922 mentions the colored fire sequences. Quote, the fire shows the burning of the seaside villa. Hand coloring has given a lurid and melodramatic power to the tongues of flame. That same review also clued, into the, clued us into the fire trucks. Even the sparks from the fire engines and the glare of the fire grates of the engines were shown in natural colors. And this translated reference from a Spanish newspaper confirmed that indeed the export prints, or at least the one screened in Spain, were also hand colored. The scenes look very real and their merit is increased by the fact that some are painted showing the flames and the fire engines.
And so that's it. The research, <laughs> the reconstruction, and the restoration. And to wrap up, one final clip that puts it all together. I was right on time. So this is obviously the beginning of the hand-colored sequence. I also choose this as an example because this has a mix in the end. This is mostly the American print um, source, and there's a couple shots from the Italian near the end that you can see how they were able to, to mix. There's a 1928 title and our recreation of the 22 version. As you can see, that one was one where the text was the same, but we went back to the 1922 appearance. There's what the Italian source looked like. All right, um, thank you. <laughs> okay, what, what do you think, how long? Okay, so, oh, so, so no Q&A? Okay, we have time for one question. <laughs> but make it good. <laughs> Um, w the score that will accompany the film tomorrow night, will that be the, um, the Sigmund Romberg score, the original one from the 20s, or would it be Tim Timothy Brock's original music? No, it won't be. So the question was, tomorrow's night's score, tomorrow's, the San Francisco Silent Film Festival commissioned Timothy Brock to come up with a new score for, uh, for the film. Of course, any extant score would not fit the film that we currently have, so it would be Timothy was, was inspired by th that score, but what you will hear tomorrow night is his composition. All right, thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions later. You'll see me. <laughs> okay.